It is a way most of us see one of the most powerful countries in the Middle East. Protests and provocation, sanctions and assassination. My earliest memories of the country of Iran go back to the Shah and American hostages, blindfolded and used as bargaining chips. But the United States involvement in Iran goes back much farther. It is a Middle East relationship that has often been rocky. And as we sit here just days after missiles were fired on a base housing American military personnel, where do we stand in this complicated tit for tat? Are things really calming down or is the threat of war playing out in a Middle Eastern hotbed that is still simmering? We hope to get a better understanding of the United States Iran relationship in this program, a joint effort of KSAT 12 News and Trinity University. One of the central questions, does tension with the United States and Iran get us closer to World War III? It is a conversation with Dr. Susan Siavoshi, the Chapman Cox Professor of International Relations at Trinity University. And I want to point out, we love the people that are with us on the live stream at KSAT.com. We are also joined by people on the mini Trinity Oh, outlets, Facebook true. and their live stream and their OTT as well. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you. You are in the unique position of being an Iranian American. You were born in Iran. That's right. Talk about what that means for you. Oh, uh, in relation to this tension? Just as a person. As a person. Well, I love both countries. Um, I was born in Iran, but I chose to live in the United States. My career was shaped in the United States. Uh, so uh, what is really heartbreaking for me is the longstanding te tension that you spoke about. And that is uh, um, what sometimes defined my life as an American Iranian. Personally, I've never felt either threatened or when the tension flares up. But um, I know that as a community, we have this perpetual angst in some ways that uh, ever since the revolution, uh, that uh, this is always under the surface, if not on the surface. And that is sort of problematic. You like to, one would like to, uh, the two countries that one loves, uh, loves uh, to be uh, in a better relationship. So that is something that I miss dearly. Um, yeah. Your so. hope is that the Iran and the United States would eventually have some type of at least diplomatic relations well, or yes, at least recognize each other. Absolutely, and, that's, that's my fondest hope. Uh, whether it's going to happen or not is difficult to say, it's difficult to predict, but I can't see any other real solution. Uh, to uh, uh, to this relationship. Are you still in contact with people who live in Iran? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I am in contact. Uh, my sister lives in Iran. Right now she's in Germany, actually. But I have friends. Uh, I have uh, relatives who live in Iran. And um, yes, I am. What is the average... This is a question that I have off the top. Mm -hmm. What does the average Iranian think about America and the American people. Not the, I'm not talking about the Ayatollah, I'm not talking about the, the government leaders, the average Iranian. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know whether there is a, such a thing uh, as an average uh, Iranian because a country of 80 million, yeah. there are lots of opinions. Uh, some of them are well-educated opinion about United States. Some have um, idealistic vision of United States and some uh, are very distrustful of United States. Uh, but what is important for us to know in this country that the caricature of this angry man raising their fist and saying death to America is not what Iran is all about. Uh, Iranians, uh, like, like us, are ordinary people. They love their children. They think about what they should have for dinner at night. Uh, they would like to live in peace uh, and harmony. Um, now, whether that's always possible or not is a different question. 
but uh, an average Iranian, if, if you ask me, I would say it's like an average American. Yeah. Uh, would like to have a comfortable life, uh, make, make a living uh, for themselves and their children. And uh, so what is happening at this moment with the sanctions and really uh, awful economic situation, which uh, even medicines is sometimes sanctioned, so Iranian, average Iranian are very stressed out about yeah. this. And, and they don't blame just United States, they blame their own government as well. Uh, so it's very interesting in the latest protest, uh, the University of Amir Kabir in Tehran, um, uh, I don't remember the exact name of the university, but there was a statement where the student uh, who were protesting against uh, the handling of Ukraine air aircraft right. that, that tragically that was shot down. Yes, right. shut down, uh, they didn't just say that to our government, which sometimes you hear in some protests, they blamed both the reckless act of Trump administration as well as the problems with the government. So they see it both as a problem of internal oppression and imperialism. Yeah, and one of the one of the big differences between Iran and the United States, the forms of government. I mean, when, when am I wrong in describing Iranians' government as authoritarian? You're not. You're not wrong. Uh, but uh, what does it mean to have an authoritarian system? It's, 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 it's actually a very complicated uh, system. If you look at the Constitution, of course, uh, in practice, it differs, and it differs from time to time. Yeah. And uh, it has authoritarian uh, elements to it. It has a theological or, or theocratic uh, element to it, but it also has democratic, republican um, uh, element to it. But once Iran feels, or the leaders feels insecure, both domestically and outside, then the autocratic uh, element uh, become much more um, pronounced right. and, and most of them have the levers of powers in their hand but it's not as we can't just say okay it's authoritarian and leave it there and right. understand what's going on in, within the system well, let's talk about some of the questions that we have we have some okay. great questions that we got on Twitter on our SAQ thing on ksat.com as well as uh, through Facebook, and we're hoping to still get questions as this discussion goes on. Sure. But what brought on the new round of tension mm -hmm. between the United States and Iran, in your opinion? I would say that we should start with 2018, uh, when uh, President Trump decided to exit unilaterally. Uh, from JCPOA, which stand uh, for so nuclear, uh, the nuclear. Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is mm -hmm. a nuclear deal between uh, uh, un uh, the five uh, permanent members of uh, the Security Council plus Germany. And uh, this agreement was to, uh, uh, to put severe limitation and control system on Iran's uh, nuclear activity in exchange for uh, sanction relief. Right. And it was working. Uh, and uh, Iran uh, was hoping that at some point it's, this would lead uh, to a greater integration uh, with the rest of the world, particularly the reformists within Iran were hoping for that. Uh, now, what is the intention for this exit? Why did it happen? Um, it happened, or the goal was to put maximum pressure on the Iranian state to either, uh, through crippling economic sanction, to, to either cave in and retract from regional engagement, uh, offensive or defensive, depending right. on your point of view, yeah. and also uh, uh, um, either, either that or regime change. Uh, people rising up and revolting against the system. And Iran, for a year, just didn't do anything, hoping that European will salvage the deal. It didn't happen, so Iran started to show muscles, to put mines on um, Saudi uh, tankers, to attack the oil, uh, uh, oil um, facilities in mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. But it was still quite careful not to have casualties. 
Um, so this is the background, and then there are immediate reasons, like the death of a contractor. And right, the and then the, the assassination of... And then the assassination of Soleimani. It, the assassination of this uh, top-ranking general yes. uh, in Iran, was the U.S. justified legally and morally to mm. do this? That's, a, that's okay. a, I know, a tough question to ask. Yeah. Well, I'm not a legal expert, but I, I have uh, listened to those who are legal experts. If you look at the international law, uh, the idea is that um, uh, you can, you can uh, do this kind of action in self-defense. But self-defense means that the danger has to be imminent, uh, a response uh, necessary and proportional. Now, the Trump administration in the beginning argued that it was an imminent uh, threat, but uh, as, as uh, days passed, uh, we realized that the discourse changed partially because of the uh, response uh, of, of some of the critics, including uh, people in the Congress who were Republican, like Mark Lee. Uh, but I think the most challenging thing for uh, for um, the Trump administration was was um, sort of the, the double talk or, or different discourse within the administration because uh, President Trump came and says, well, there were imminent threats against four embassies. Right. And then uh, Defense uh, Secretary says that uh, I haven't seen those uh, those actual threats. It's probable, but I haven't seen it. How could a defense minister, uh, secretary haven't seen this? So they change uh, the discourse and argued otherwise. So if you take that, that is against the international law. Another thing is that based on international law, you cannot, you have to have respect for the sovereignty of the country where attack happened. And so, Iraqis were not consulted, and Iraq uh, Prime Minister actually because this happened in Baghdad. That. The yes. assassination it, actually it, happened, it happened in Baghdad. In Baghdad. Yeah. Yes. yeah. It, it, let's talk about see, not so much the legal or the moral right, but what kind of guy Soleimani was. I mean, if you listen oh. to mm -hmm. United States mm -hmm. leaders, they will tell you he was connected with many terrorist groups right. who have carried mm -hmm. out attacks that mm -hmm. have killed Americans, right. um, and that he was a guy that needed to go. Yeah. Is that accurate? Well, uh, needed to go from whose point of view, of course, but uh, well, not so from much that, United, but, but yes. I mean, it, the terrorist okay, ties. Let, the, me, let me explain. Uh, Soleimani was uh, a person who came uh, to age or, or, or was, uh, his, his worldview was very much uh, informed by the Iran-Iraq war, where Iran was basically alone. Mm -hmm. And Iraq has all this support, particularly including the United States support, even when it uh, used chemical weapons. Uh, so uh, Soleimani and others like him felt that Iran is vulnerable and that vulnerability actually threaten the uh, um, territorial integrity of Iran. So uh, with this idea, he, he was a very smart guy. He was uh, a very daring person. And he became the head of Quds uh, Force, which is the external uh, wing of uh, Revolutionary Guard. And he was in that position for 22 years. He did something that we didn't like, like he made Hezbollah, uh, which we consider as uh, a terrorist group, a very potent military force. Mm -hmm. He, uh, in by the invitation of Assad, went into Syria and helped uh, the Assad regime to survive. But he also did things that we like, and we actually did it together in some ways, parallel, but, uh, and that was the fight against ISIS. He was instrumental uh, uh, for the, one of the most important uh, person to attack ISIS and push them out of Mosul and Kirkuk and other places. Uh, and we at that time really, there was a gentlemanly agreement not to deal with each other, not to kill each other, so, so there right. was that. Uh, and, uh, and, and let me uh, finish this by saying that he was, in fact, uh, uh, 
up to then, he was basically working in some ways with American, but after the um, exit from JCPOA, or J JCPOA that Iran changed uh, its approach eventually, and uh, he, along with some other, particularly hardliner, decided that this was not working. Yeah. And they became, they showed their military muscle. Yeah, you know, usually when you say something in the past, like World War III, mm -hmm. at least to me, when it yeah. hits my ears, I think hyperbole. It is hyperbole, I have it, to say. And so my question is, are, we, are you convinced that both sides have kind of backed away at this point from, a, from an armed confrontation? Well, at the moment, it seems that way, but there are a lot of things that trouble me and I am worried about uh, because sometimes escalation is not just based on what two leaders or two countries elite uh, would like to pursue. Or missiles flying uh, through the air. Uh, or, 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 because I, I know that President Trump, after um, uh, Iran's missile uh, attack was saying that, okay, well, everything is fine, nobody uh, got injured or, or hurt, although there were some uh, hurt, but uh, Iran was also, before sending the missile, informed uh, Abdul Mahdi, the uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Iraq, that we are going to do that, right, so they had knowing warning. well that yeah. they are going to tell the, the administration, but things might get out of hand, and I'm worried about two things. One is uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, a very important Iraqi militia leader also was killed. Right. And even though those militias are supported by Iran, but they might, without uh, the consent of Iran, do their own um, uh, uh, you know, revenge, take their own revenge, and that is problematic because we here can blame Iran for it right. and then that might es escalate. Another thing which I think is somewhat even more problematic in the long term is that if we squeeze Iran a lot and the leaders think that they're desperate, desperate people do desperate things. And, uh, and, I and if we have a war and if they escalate and we go into a real war, uh, this is not going to be a picnic. It's not even a war like a war in Iraq, which we have, we're still there for 18 years uh, later. We haven't accomplished much. In fact, uh, we, uh, ISIS was created as, as an important threat to us and to others, we, the, the destabilization. Iran is, has managed because of its isolation. Iran is a strategically lonely country. So its missile uh, defense and its, uh, experience in asymmetrical warfare uh, make Iran a very potent uh, and formidable foe, not in a conventional way, but in a guerrilla asymmetrical way. Yeah, yeah, okay, I appreciate your answer to those questions and that, You're that's, because that's, when you hear about Iraqi militia, a lot of people are also concerned about Hezbollah and yeah. some of those other right. terrorist groups may carry out some sort of attacks right. that somehow tie back yeah. to Iran right. as well. Right. We, we got a lot of questions from people on our SAQ and okay. I want to I get to some of those sure. questions. Uh, one of them that I want to get to right off the top is why is only one religious belief allowed in Iran? This is submitted by Anonymous and I, the reason I bring this up is because I'm not an Iranian expert, but you are. This does not seem, this is not entirely accurate. That's not true. Yes, it is not accurate. In fact, uh, according to Islam and by Iranian, uh, there is uh, uh, people of the books, uh, the Christian, Jews, Zoroastrian, um, are people of the book, and uh, and of course uh, some others like Buddhists and Hindus are also tolerated. Now, if, do they have the same kind of political right? No. And and the most persecuted uh, religious group is the Baha'is, that are uh, basically, um, as I said, sort of persecuted. They mm -hmm. they don't they can't go to universities. Uh, they're um, property is sometimes in danger. But as far as the question is concerned, no, it's not accurate. Yeah, there, there's not one religion that's allowed, but there's really no. one religion that's in power. It, there is a one, one religion, Islam, which is uh, the predominant religion, and uh, people who adhere to it have most 
rights. Uh, although, as I said, the Jews, the Christian, and the Zoroastrian uh, also have representation in the government, but you know, as minorities, they are vulnerable. Right. Okay, here's another good question. Benjamin Gonzalez asks, where does Iran get their weapons? Well, that's an interesting question. The Iran, most of uh, Iran's weapon is uh, uh, made in Iran because, as I said, Iran was strategically lonely, uh, and therefore, it, it uh, after after it realized that it cannot rely during the Iran-Iraq war cannot rely on any country to give them arms. Although some did, you know. Russia did to some extent, yeah. and China. But uh, the convention, uh, the missile, of course, you can you can get some uh, elements or, or some component from other countries. But Iran itself has made some of uh, its important. They make uh, their own tanks. Uh, they make they, their own. They they made a lot yeah. of their uh, arm uh, armament. Uh, it, am I correct that Syria is really considered their? biggest ally in the area, Assad well, uh, in particular? Assad, you know, Syria and Iran go uh, a long way. Yeah. Because during Iran-Iraq war, Syria was the only country, Arab country, that supported Iran or didn't support Iraq. Uh, and uh, as I said, Iran feels, whether one accepts it or not, feels sort of um, contained. Uh, U.S., it's around Iran. And then you have hostile forces in uh, Persian Gulf. I mean, why they're hostile is, is a long story. I'm not going there. But, but the fact of the matter, uh, Iran is worried about them. Iran is also worried about Israel. So what it does is that it tries to, get, uh, to create a corridor from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. So for example, if uh, Israel decide to attack Iran as it said many times, whether it does or not, it's a different question, yeah. that the Hezbollah will, uh, uh, so, so Iran produce, uh, can, can, can deliver uh, weapons to Hezbollah through Syria, so that is an important geopolitical uh, area for, for um, it, it, Iran. It's interesting that you bring up the motivations of feeling isolated and, and mm -hmm. not having necessarily mm -hmm. someone that's going to provide them mm -hmm. weapons, they provide them from themselves. Could also explain why someone like Soleimani is reaching out to terrorist groups because he doesn't, it does, like you said, desperate people do desperate things. If that's your motivation, you're going to reach uh, out to whoever you have to well, to feel um, secure. Okay, uh, Soleimani didn't think of those people as uh, as terrorists. terrorists. Uh, Iran's uh, narrative is that these are the axis of resistance, okay. resistance against to them an imperial power and its allies. Yes. So that's, that's how what, he that's, saw them. The that's rest of the world exactly. Sees them well, uh, most of the rest. Yes, of the world. that's yeah. right. All right. The next question from our SAQ: Why? can't the president get troops out of the Middle East? This is from Leslie Martinez. Uh, she asked specifically about troops in Iran, but to clarify, the troops, the United States troops are in Iraq. Right. So I guess why shouldn't the president get troops out of the Middle East, I think is, is a I think is a uh, I think President Trump really wanted to. And uh, uh, there are actually, I have some conservative friends uh, from the military who are saying that we don't mind if U.S. get out of uh, Iraq. 18 years is enough yeah. to be there. But the, the issue is ISIS for the most part. Uh, the remnant of ISIS is, uh, is there. And, and that is why, uh, you know, there are things that connect Iran and United States in a, in should connect them in a harmonious way, fighting with ISIS. Uh, so so that, is, that is an important, uh, I think this is the most important reason why the uh, forces of US are there. Uh, there is an element of, uh, Kurdish issue, which is actually more pertinent to Syrian Kurds right. than to Iraqi Kurds, because those are two different parts of uh, of the Kurdish population. So that's uh, probably why uh, it's is the ISIS. To that's the the, the most important reason, yeah. I think. Um, so I, this leads into the next question, okay. and this is from uh, Raphael, who asks, "What course of action?" would you take going forward? 
And so Me? I, you, if you're, you're the you leader know, of which country? Let's say you're the leader <laughs> of the United States. What course of action would you, you take know, okay. going forward? I, I think uh, the course of action is that I will think of war as the last resort. So I would see whether there are uh, element of diplomacy. I will get in touch with the allies uh, and try to create a diplomatic uh, uh, sort of uh, corridor so we can uh, uh, talk to the Iranians. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard right now. I mean, President Trump, in, uh, after Iran uh, missile attack, went on TV and I, it started sort of we never allow, I never allowed uh, Iran to have nuclear weapon. And, but toward the end, it sa he said uh, that uh, he, he gave it olive branch, but it is just so sort of mixed with threat that no one can understand in Iran where he's coming from. But at the moment, uh, I, I, this is what I think. I think the sanction, the increasing sanction is detrimental. I think we should uh, scale back uh, in the sanction, talk to our allies, talk to Russia, talk to China, talk to Turkey, and see whether there can be some sort of uh, a diplomatic way to go forward. Our, you realize that our viewers are putting you on the spot there wanting to know exactly what you would do. And yeah. so I, I want to thank our SAQ uh, uh, people that have chimed in on the KSAT app, uh, KSAT.com SAQ San Antonio questions that they've sent in. Um, thank you, Rafael, for that one. Here's another one. And we actually got a similar question to this on Twitter as well. Oh. Uh, why did the CIA execute a coup in Iran in 1953 why not peace? And it, it, it was the United States and the UK that basically yeah. started that coup. That's, that's, that's considered it. history. And I want to thank Omar for uh, sending this in. Yeah, I think Omar is the same person that put it in on Twitter, too, when we posted I this out, I you know, talking yeah. about the coup in 1953 mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't necessarily yeah. yes. know about. It, that's very interesting. You know, one of the things that I always tell my student and others, I said, uh, where, when does uh, history start, the tension? Is it the hostage crisis in 1997, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1979, or is it the coup in 1953? Why United States uh, uh, involve itself in this coup? You have to come take my class because it's a whole uh, <laughs> semester. But I just, in a nutshell, is that we were going through a, a, a Cold War at that time. Uh, it was, the question was, I mean, the idea was that you're either with us or you're against us. So, and Iran wanted to be non-aligned. Uh, and so that's one thing, the political aspects. But the other thing was oil. Uh, of course, Iran uh, nationalized its oil. United States in the beginning supported Iran, but then uh, uh, partially with uh, UK convinced United States, but, but, but we also have a change in the administration in the United States, uh, um, um, uh, which and Foster Dulles and others came and they were very uh, ardent Cold Warrior, mm -hmm. and they didn't trust a government which was democratic, but uh, sort of uh, maybe weak, and they wanted to have a strong man who would uh, be a bulwark against the Soviet Union. This was and a its democratic allies. government in Iran. Yes, that was it was a democratic government in Iran in 1953. We overthrew the democratic government and reinstated. Uh, a, uh, 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 an authoritarian figure yeah in Iran yeah what do you when you see when you saw the assassination heard the news of the assassination of Soleimani and then you saw the missiles going from Iran into mm -hmm. Iraq what was going through your mind when that was happening well when the uh, assassination happened it was uh, the weekend and my friend read that to me and I was shocked and I was my first reaction was disbelief and shock and then I said oh my god it's just gonna get bad and worse and I was very afraid I was very afraid for uh, how Iran will react to this uh, because of the importance of Soleimani who was uh, um, uh, 
very powerful man. I don't know whether he was the second most powerful man, but he was basically a very powerful man. And you saw his popularity when it came, um, when millions of people pour into the street. And I knew exactly that Iranian leader, whether they wanted or not, could not not answer. And, uh, and they had to do something direct from Iran because Iran MO up to then was that just sort of do it in a way that can create a deniability for mm -hmm. them. Uh, but that was that's why the missiles were were sent, but Iran didn't want escalation because Iran knows that cannot win a conventional war against the US. And we, I don't think US want a, a military confrontation direct with Iran. But after the Ukrainian jet was uh, shot down after it took off from Tehran airport, there were protests against the Iranian government. Yes. Your read on those protests, does it mean anything? Well, you know, the, the protest, uh, of course, was somehow also related. It was a tragic event. Everybody was heartbroken. The, the, the way Iran uh, hid the information from uh, its uh, people, that was really awful. Um, uh, but um, uh, many of these uh, uh, protests, first of all, this protest was very different from the protests that happened a few months ago. Uh, that was mostly for economic reason when Iran hiked the uh, oil, um, right. uh, I mean, the gasoline price. It went up like 300%. Uh, right, yeah. right. And uh, uh, this, was, uh, th 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 this was mostly a middle class, well educated protest, this one. So uh, when you think about what does it mean, I don't think it means that the regime is in, uh, in, uh, in a dire danger of being toppled. Because as we saw in the uh, Soleimani um, uh, funerals, uh, there, were, there were a lot of people who still uh, either support the regime but don't, or don't want Iran to be disintegrated or go into another revolution or what have you. Uh, and, and the, the, the fact of the matter is that opposition in Iran is not, the, there are different opposition. One is a class opposition uh, where the poorer people, those who are really hit by economic uh, sanctions. sanctions and other, and, and corruption, et cetera, are, are, are demanding change. And then there is a, uh, there is a, uh, cities, Tehran, uh, middle class uh, protests that want freedom of expression and all sorts of other things. Whether this will lead to another revolution as the Trump administration hope, I don't think it will. Yeah. I'm going to give you the final word here. People that are watching at home who are watching this either live or will watch it on our OTT KSAT TV app mm. or on the Trinity mm. apps. What, what's your message that you want them to take home? about the uh, relationship yeah. between the United States and I Iran. think I would like my American compatriot uh, really um, hold their leaders, whether Democrats or Republican, accountable. Going to war is not, as I said, is not a picnic. We have to uh, make sure that we use all the other uh, avenues and ways that we can uh, before we go to war. And for that, I, uh, I would like to urge people to educate themselves, to uh, read different perspective from different areas of the world. Um, and then I, uh, I would like to also in, in order to uh, uh, exhaust all the diplomatic ways for us to think of these people as people, not just caricatures, not just as angry men, not just as, as mullahs, and understand, uh, humanize them, and also understand that uh, the other side might have some legitimate security fear and threat. And the question is that how do we put all these things together and try to, to um, form an opinion about the situation and then uh, relay our message to our leaders? Well, I hope the dialogue that you and I have had and with some of the viewers out there uh, has led us down that path. I hope so, too. And I, and I just want to say, uh, having done some research uh, for this interview on Iran and the history of Iran, I knew some of it. But it is a fascinating country. I mean, you're talking about 
Greek influence. You're talking about Italian influence. You're talking about, of course, the, the Muslim influence. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating country. And vice history. versa. And vice versa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Suzanne Suavoshi from Trinity University, thank you for joining us. Thank you for thank having you, me. Thank you for joining us, students and just average South Texans alike. This will live on on KSAT TV. That's it for our live stream. Have a great day. Bye-bye.